All right, let's pray together. Father, I thank you tonight that we have already met with you. Lord, I pray as that we look into your word, we would continue to meet with you. Father, to this end, that we would remember our calling. That we would understand and get a glimpse of just how valuable we are to you and to the body of Christ, and we would walk in that power. God, we ask these things today in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Um, they've asked me, the team's asked me in this session to speak on having a vision for theology. Now, it's obvious we got a room full of um, worship leaders and artists in the church. I could obviously talk about good theology in our writing and in our song choices, but as I've been thinking about it over the last couple of weeks, I've realized that getting a vision for theology is a much bigger topic than just what we're writing in our music. That's part of it, but it's broader than that. And so I want to give you just a, here's a quick definition of theology. So we're all on the same page here. Definition of theology is the study of the nature and the character of God. It's the study of the nature and the character of God. And so what I want to do tonight is I want to talk about the role that worship plays in theology. I want to talk about the role that worship plays in portraying to the body of Christ the character and the nature of God. And I want to talk about how our role as worship leaders and people that are involved in worship in the church in portraying the character and nature of God is not just important, but I want to make an argument tonight that it's critical. I want to make an argument tonight that it's essential for the body of Christ. And for far too long, pastors and preacher types like myself, guys like me, I honestly think there's a lot of us that have not understood the critical role that worship plays in helping people experience and encounter the character and the nature of God. And what I've seen guys that are pastors like myself, what I've seen them do is, is too often we've used worship leaders as props and time fillers and entertainers and environment creators. And in my humble opinion, the body of Christ is suffering because of it. Now, some of you guys may, may know this, some of you not, but um, I planted the Austin Stone in 2002, and Chris Tomlin was actually my worship leader, and he planted the stone with me. He's, he's done pretty well in this worship thing. Um, but <clears throat> he would hear pastors talking like this about the role of worship and worship leaders, and it just, it was a massive pet for him. He hated it, and, and I knew he hated it, and so I would mess with him, right? And I would say things to him like, hey, man, you know, and I was joking, but I'd be like, hey, man, you know that historically preachers have had a greater impact on the kingdom of God than worship leaders. Like, you know that, don't you? And he, he would get so mad at me, and sometimes we, we kind of had just this running argument. He would just send me a text with like a famous songwriter. He would just send me a text that said, Charles Wesley, and I would send a text back with a famous pastor who just said, Charles Spurgeon, right? And it was just kind of a draw, you know? And one time he texted me, he was a famous songwriter, and he added a famous song. <clears throat> he texted, John Newton, Amazing Grace. And I texted back a famous pastor with a famous book. I wrote, John Bunyan, Pilgrim's Progress. It was a draw. And that went on for a long time, but one day I got him. I got him. He simply texted me, 23rd Psalm, King David. And I responded, Sermon on the Mount, King Jesus. And he wrote back, all right, man, you got me. Now, I was messing with him, I really am. But I, I, unfortunately, I, as a pastor myself, I'm around it all the time. That reality of thinking is far too common. Again, I've met so many senior pastors in the church setting, in the academic setting that have a really bad habit, in my opinion, of, of diminishing and downplaying the role of worship and communicating to the body of Christ the character and the nature of God. I can't tell you how many guys that I've met and how many guys that I know that look at worship simply as a Sunday morning time filler in order to get to the thing that they think really matters, which is the preaching of God's word. Now listen, make no mistake. <clears throat> I'm not diminishing in any shape, form, or fashion the preaching of God's word. I have a, I have a doctorate in expositional preaching for crying out loud. The, the, the preaching of God's word is of paramount importance. It's critical. 
But what I see in scripture and what I've experienced in my own life is that worship through music has a unique and it has a powerful ability to not only communicate the nature and the character of God, but it helps the body of Christ actually experience the nature and the character of God in a way that's absolutely critical for the body of Christ. So in my talk tonight, very quickly, all I want to do, I want to give you three quick points of, of sort of three quick reasons, rather, why worship through, through music plays an essential role, essential theological role in today's church. Here's point number one. Worship through song allows Christ followers not only to hear God's word, but experience God's word. Worship through music allows Christ followers not only to hear God's word, but experience God's word. So it's, it's pretty well documented that sort of the, the rising generation, Gen Z and, and millennials, they're, they're significantly less didactic in their learning styles than, than previous generations. In other words, what I'm saying is that this rising generation of Christ followers, they're more experiential in their learning style than this old Gen Xers and baby boomers ever thought about being. And one, one of the ways to sort of think about this is this, that, is that most people in the younger generation learn best, not in two-dimensional environments, but three-dimensional environments. And here's what I mean by that. A two-dimensional environment is where information is being presented from a speaker to a hearer. That's, that's predominantly what preaching is. That's predominantly what's happening right now. I stand in the pulpit, I preach God's word and the people receive it, they hear it and they process it in their minds. But a three-dimensional environment is, is when a person is immersed in that information. It's all around them, they can touch it, they can feel it, they can experience it. That same information, right? For so many people, they learn best not when they're simply hearing something, but when they tangi tangibly experience that same thing in an immersive way. Now, I've been thinking about it. What is worship if it's not kind of a three-dimensional environment? I mean, let me just give you an example of what I'm talking about. It's one thing for me to stand in front of you tonight and say these truths about the Word of God. I could say this. I could say, guys... Church, God is faithful. God is gracious. And because he is faithful and, he, and his graciousness, our response should be gratefulness. And if church, if that were not enough, God doesn't need a single thing. He doesn't need a single thing. He's completely sufficient. But despite all that, he still wants your heart. I can say that. And that's true. And that's powerful. And it has the ability to change people's lives. Those are life-changing words. But at the end of the day, that was a two-dimensional exchange. I spoke it. You heard it. Think about what happens then. When I, as a preacher, present that, that same truth from God's word, but then my worship leader, Aaron Ivey, when he stands up and leads us in the song, As You Find Me by Hillsong Worship. And after they've heard the word, people stand and they turn their eyes to the Lord and they get face to face with God. And with their own voice, they begin to sing, who am I to think your glory, God, needs my praises? God, but with this borrowed breath is, is your Lord. Take it all. You, God, you are faithful, Lord. You are gracious. And I'm just grateful to think you don't need a single thing. And God... You still want my heart. Guys, there's power, than, there's power in that. Not only did we just teach them one of the most amazing realities in Scripture, but then what we, what we do is we lead them to then proclaim that same reality with their own mouths in a three-dimensional, experiential, face-to-face -face encounter with the living God. That's what worship does. Worship allows the body of Christ to not just hear the truth, but it helps them interact with the truth in a tangible and a physical way. And if you really think about it, if you really think about the Bible and you think about the whole Bible and you think about how life change occurs in the whole of the scripture, think about how often tangible life change occurs. And when does it occur and why does it occur? I mean, yeah, you see, you see people's lives being radically changed through preaching. It's commanded in the scripture. You see Peter at Pentecost, he preaches 3,000 people trusting Christ. You see, 
But what you also see over and over again is that real sustained life change so often occurs in these three-dimensional, tangible, face-to-face sort of encounters with the presence of God. You see Isaiah, he enters into the presence of God. He falls on his face, says, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. You see Moses in the burning bush. You see Matthew encountering Jesus You see the woman at the well encountering Jesus, the woman caught in adultery, Uh, Paul on the road to Damascus, Peter on the beach after the resurrection. The Bible is full of these stories where people don't just hear about the truth, but they interact with the truth. They don't just hear about the person of God, but they interact with the presence of God and they're never the same again. Now, again, do people encounter the presence of God through preaching? Absolutely. The word of God is living and it's active and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And if the guitar had never been invented, God's word would have been enough. Amen? God's word would have been enough to accomplish everything that God ever wanted to accomplish through his word, but at the same time to diminish the role of worship and presenting the character and the nature of God is absolutely absurd. And if I could snap my fingers and get every pastor in America to go to a conference, that'd be cool, wouldn't it? Just make them all go. We could teach them anything we wanted to teach them. This would be one of the things I'd want to teach them. I'd want to talk to them about the critical role of worship in the church today. And here's what I'd tell them. I'd say, guys, stop looking at worship and your worship leaders and those guys that are doing that and those women that are doing that in your church as a time filler Stop looking at your worship leaders as entertainers. Stop looking at your worship leaders as a nice little warm-up that people get to experience before they hear you preach. And you know why I would say that to them? I'd say that, and I'd look at them, and I'd say, you know why I say that? Because your worship leaders are preachers. Your worship leaders are preachers, except they're preaching the word of God in a way that causes your people to actually interact with God's worship, with God's word and the way that the younger generation is wired. Guys, I think that might be more important than at any other time in our lives. A little just real quick side note, talking about theology here. That's why it's so important that our theology is strong in our songs. Because I I think maybe you guys get that. But if you don't, let me just tell you, you have a unique, you have a unique power to help this generation experience the knowledge and the character of God in a really fresh way, in a way that they are going to receive it. And so make no mistake, you are a preacher and you got to make sure that you're presenting the character and the nature of God in the right way. So that's the first one. Here's the second reason that worship through song is critical in communicating the character of nature of God. Number two, worship through song allows the knowledge of God to go from the mind down into the heart and the soul. Worship through song allows the knowledge of God to go from the mind down into the heart and the soul. Here's the, here's the point that I'm making here is that worship not only has the power to help us experience God and his character and his nature in a tangible three-dimensional kind of way, but worship has this sort of unique ability to take the knowledge of God and move it down inside of us into our hearts and into our souls. Y'all, y'all know that uh, song, Love Came Down. There's a line in there that's just hauntingly true. It's just hauntingly true. The line says, mountain high or valley low, I sing out and remind my soul. Valley, mountain high, valley low, I sing out and remind my soul that I am yours, God, that I am forever yours. And we can hear all day long that we belong to God. And that's, that's good. We need it. The word of God has power. We can hear that all day long and it reminds our minds, but there's something about when we stand up and we sing that truth, God, I am yours, that it reminds our soul. Our souls are the seat of our emotions. And when we sing that truth, listen, when we sing that truth, we don't just hear it, but we start to feel it. We start to feel it. And I heard a pastor the other day that was talking about this very subject. 
but he took a radically different take than me. And here's what he said. He said, theology and worship matters. True statement. Theology and worship matters. He said, it's not about how the song makes us feel that matters. It's what the song communicates about God that matters. Now, part of what he said, I agree with. I really do. What we communicate God matters. It matters a whole lot. But the other thing he said, I personally think is dead wrong on its face. I think what the song makes us feel is actually really important. And going back to the hypothetical pastor's conference that we would make all our pastor friends go to, I, I, would, I, I wish that we could teach the pastors of the world that worship leaders are not only preachers, but they're theologians of the soul. They're theologians of the soul. The Holy Spirit uses worship to take the knowledge of God, and not only does it solidify it in our minds, but, but worship transfers it down, and we feel it in such a way that it begins to sink into our soul really quickly. I just want to read a quote to you by this, this guy. His name's J.C. Ryle, and, and a old theologian, and, and, and he talks a little bit about this. He says, personal application has been called the soul of preaching. And the mere form of hearing a sermon can profit no man. He might as well just listen to the blowing of a trumpet or the beating of a drum. He might as well just attend a Roman Catholic service in Latin. Why? Because his intellect must be set into motion and then his heart and his soul must be impressed and moved to action. Without this, he hears in vain. Now listen, what he said here is critical that when we hear the word of God, not only do we need to receive it in our minds, but it has to be impressed down into our souls or we will never walk out the doors and live it out. And what JC was talking about, he was talking about sermon application, but in my opinion, and this is just my opinion, but worship through singing ought to be the first step of the application of any sermon. So we hear the word of God. The Christ follower hears the word of God. But I really do think that there's a critical step. We need to sing it. We need to sing it because when we sing it, we start to feel it. And as we feel it, that, that's going to transfer down into our souls and down into our hearts. And we got a much better chance of going and living it out. And one of the guys, one of the biggest pet peeves of my whole life um, and I've heard this more often than not in academic settings. I, and and I'm, I'm going to talk about beats per minute. I may be wrong, so don't like hate me if I get the beats per minute wrong here. But I can't tell you how many times I've heard some pastor type guy say something to the effect of, you know, music at 78 beats per minute releases endorphins. And so people just feel a certain thing, but it's not real. And we shouldn't have worship that does that because it manipulates people. I hear that all the time. Now listen, can music be used to emotionally manipulate people? I guess, but here's what I always say. Here's what I always push back and I say, who do you think created men and women to release endorphins at 78 beats per minute? I got y'all's back, guys. I do, I ask them and I just stand there and they don't say anything. No, no answer the question. Who created men to release endorphins at 78 beats per minute? I was like, God did. And then I asked him another question. Did God do that so that when you're watching a football game and your team scores, you can release endorphins when the band starts playing? Is that why God did it? Or, or do you think God created us that way so that when we worship, not only do we give glory to God, but it also helps us take that theology, the knowledge of the character of God and actually get us to the place where we start feeling it. And when we feel it, we'll go out there and live it. Point number one, worship through music allows Christ followers not only to hear God's word, but experience God's word. Point number two, worship through song allows the knowledge of God to go from the mind down into the heart and the soul. And here's the last point. Worship through song fills us with his spirit and shepherds us into the life of God. Worship through music fills us with 
his spirit and shepherds us into the life of God. I want to read a verse to you real quick. Ephesians 18, or excuse me, Ephesians 5, 18. Paul says this. He says, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the spirit. And so Paul begins and he says this, he says, do not get drunk with wine. That's proof that Paul was a Southern Baptist right there. Do not get drunk with wine, Paul says, and he says, be filled with the Spirit, okay? Now, I want you to look at that phrase. We still got it there. I want you to look at the phrase, be filled. Let me nerd out on you for a second. In the, in the Greek, that's the present imperative. Listen carefully. That's a verb that means to have an immediate but an ongoing reaction. And so what Paul is literally saying is don't get drunk with wine, but be continually being filled with the Spirit. That's what he's saying. He's saying be continually filled with the Spirit. And his point is if, is if left unattended, if we're not continuously filled with the Spirit, the Spirit's power is still there in us. But we won't walk in the fullness of that power if we're not filled with his Spirit. The Spirit of God can your ability to experience the power of the Spirit of God, and you can diminish if you're not being filled with His Spirit. One way to think about it is this. Um, when I was in college, I went to uh, Texas A&M University, and I was a part of the ROTC. They're called the Corps Cadets. And when I was a freshman, they shaved my head. It was horrible. And, and we counted one day, and we had done a 1,000 push-ups and a 1,000 sit-ups and ran four miles. And that was a pretty typical day. And guys, I was ripped. I was a beautiful specimen of man. I know it's hard to imagine that now, but my, my face was all chiseled and I had a six pack and I didn't have any love handles, a beautiful specimen. But I graduated. I graduated and I made the life decision that I'm never running again the rest of my life. Unless somebody is chasing me and trying to kill me, I'm not running and I may not even run then. You know, I'm not ever doing it. And I quit doing push-ups and I quit doing sit-ups and I completely quit exercising. And after about a month or so, I looked down one day, true story, this happened, and the six-pack was gone. And I started sort of finding and fat in places that I'd never really had it before. And what I realized pretty quickly is that when the exercise went away, the beautiful specimen of man went away, right? And that's exactly, that's exactly what Paul's saying. That when you and I are filled with the, with the Spirit of God, that we can experience and we can walk in the power of God. But if we're not continuously being filled with the Spirit, we cannot experience His power to the fullest. Again, the Spirit's power doesn't diminish, but our ability to walk in the power does. And so Paul says, be being filled. Now, I want you to watch the very next thing that comes out of his mouth. Ephesians 5.18. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be being filled with the Spirit of God, comma, the next thing he says, addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. There's no commas in the Greek. Did you know that? He says, be continually being filled with the Spirit, the next word, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and making melody to the Lord with your heart. I went and asked my Greek professor in seminary. I was like, does that mean what I think it means? He looks it up and he's like, yep, that's exactly what this means. Church, here's what this means. There is a direct connection between our worship through singing and our ability to be filled with the Holy Spirit of Almighty God in our lives. It's a direct biblical connection. And I've experienced this far too many times in my life. And I'm just at the place where I'm tired of people saying that's not true. I'm here today in many ways because of worship. I think I got saved at eight. I'm pretty sure I did. I think I understood what it meant. I think I trusted in Christ. I did not walk with him. I was not filled with the Spirit as I lived out my teenage years. I went to my first semester at AM. I didn't darken the doors of a church. I was running from God. I was sinning like crazy. A friend of mine invited me to a Bible study. I reluctantly said yes. I walked into that Bible study the first time I had been in a church. 
in a long time, probably close to a year. And as I walked in, I went over to a pew and I sort of stood there and the worship leader walked up and he grabbed the guitar and he began to sing this song, Lord, you are more precious than silver. Lord, you are more costly than gold. Lord, you are more beautiful than diamonds and nothing I desire compares to you. And when he began to sing it again, I did something for the first time in my entire life. I began to worship God. For the first time in my entire life. I'd never done it before then. I wasn't just hearing those realities, but I actually began to say them to Almighty God. Lord, you are more precious than silver. Lord, you are more costly than gold. Lord, you are more beautiful than diamonds and nothing I desire compares to you. And I remember in that moment, literally thinking to myself, as I was being filled with the Spirit of God, I remember thinking to myself, this is what I've been looking for my entire life. And I made the decision right there in that place that I was going to follow Jesus the rest of my life and I've never turned back. And I um, got called into the ministry. I was a youth pastor for a while and I was horrible at it. And, and I, I just got my tail kicked and, and I remember one time this mom of a student brought me in and uh, in my pastor's office and she looked at me and she said, you're the worst youth pastor we've ever had at this church. And I sort of looked at the pastor like, help a brother out, man. And he's just like, I kind of agree with her, you know? And so I was ready to quit. Anybody ever been there? He's like, I'm done. That's it. I'm out. A few days later, a friend of mine took me to, um, pastor's promise keepers in Atlanta, Georgia in 1996. And I'll never forget the moment that 60,000 something pastors stood up and started singing holy, holy, holy all at the same time. And I just remember, I remember feeling it, just being filled with the spirit of God and the Lord just speaking to me as clearly as he's ever spoken to me. Matt, man did not call you to preach. I did. And if man didn't call you in, then man can't call you out. But I called you in, and so I can call you out. As I was filled with the Spirit of God, I endured passion 2005. I struggled with believing that God could love a sinner like me. It's just a place that I was at. I kept hearing people talk about the love of God for us, and I, I knew it up here, but I just didn't believe it. And I had some sin in my life, and I was just like, I could not understand how God could love someone like me when I fail the way I do. And I remember, I think it was Shane and Shane. And they started singing this line. And I sang it with them. My sin, oh, the bliss of this wonderful thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole was nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, my soul. And I was filled with the spirit of God. And I was reminded by the spirit of God that my standing before God doesn't have anything to do with what I've done right or wrong. And it has everything to do with the blood of Jesus and what he shed on the cross. And I repented of my sin and I believed the love of God. It was that year, a short time later, that I was diagnosed with cancer and I went through about a three month time where we didn't know if I was gonna live or I was gonna die. And the very first Sunday after I was diagnosed and it was scary, I had little kids, I didn't wanna orphan them, I didn't wanna leave my wife, I didn't wanna leave this young church. I was scared to death and I remember walking down in the front row of our church just trembling and the first song that we sang was Blessed Be Your Name. And I lifted my hands as high as I could to the air. And with a feeble, feeble voice, I sang those words, God, you give and you take away. But my heart is going to choose to say, blessed be your name. And I was filled with the spirit and he strengthened me. And I kept walking. And I look back at all those times in my life where I was this close. 
to being overwhelmed when I was this close to just simply walking away. And God used worship to endure me. Every Sunday in our churches, we sing to give glory to God. But we also sing because there, there's some people in the row right in front of us that are having a really difficult marriage and they don't know if they can make it. We sing to give glory to God, but we also sing because there's a person that's right behind us that's struggling with sin. We sing to glorify God, but we also sing because there's a person that's a couple of rows over to our right that's walking through cancer. We sing to glorify God, but that we also sing because there's a person sitting right beside us that's forgotten their first love in Jesus. We sing to glorify God, but, 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 but we also sing because there's a person, a couple of rows beside us also that they have never tasted the love of Christ. And we sing so that those people can meet Jesus. They can be filled with his spirit. And then whatever they're walking through, they can endure through those trials. I, I'm done here. I want to do one thing. I thought about this just a second ago. I'm going to say couple of cents here. I'm going to pray and we're going to be done. If you're a worship leader here today, if you're in the band, um, if you're in sound, you're in production, if you're an artist in any shape, form, or fashion in the body of Christ, would you stand up just real quick right here? Well, that's pretty much everybody. <laughs> Some of y'all need to hear this today. You are not a prop. You are, you're not a time filler. You're not an entertainer. You're not some second tier staff person that's there to support the preacher. You are a preacher. You are a theologian. And what Paul just told us just a second ago it's not only that, but you're a pastor and you're a shepherd and you're a counselor. And friends, not only are you all those things, but you possess and you hold a unique and powerful ability to help the body of Christ experience the presence and the character and the nature of God like nobody else. And so if you're here tonight, and you're in a church and you're in a situation that doesn't get that and doesn't believe that, I want you to try to change it. And if you can't change it, I want you to know that life is too short and the battle is too real and your gifts are far too valuable to the kingdom of God for you not to be used in the way that God designed you to be used. May he lead you. May, you. may he point him, point you to himself so that you can point the body of Christ to him. All right, let's pray. Father, I pray for all these folks. Father, they have no idea how many people throughout history and throughout the world have been radically changed because of what they do. I am one of them. I would not be here tonight if it weren't for people just like them. Father, encourage them. Remind them that you are the one that called them. God, remind them that you were the one that gifted them with the gift that they have. And remind them, Lord, that you use them in ways they will never see until glory. And when that day comes, when they stand face to face with you and they're surrounded by the saints, God, you'd show them. You'd show them how they portrayed and gave an incredible, beautiful vision of the nature and the character of you, almighty God. We ask these things today in Jesus' name. Amen.